thanks very much. Okay, good to go. Um, so hello, I'm Kieran. So I'm a practice-based researcher at the 3D Viz Lab, which is based in Duncan Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. Um, so I have a paper which discusses the relationship between two media that I've been working in recently, that's um, film and virtual reality. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background about our lab and the kind of work that we do and my research, um, and then I'm going to delve into the theory side of things for a little bit, but I'm going to finish up with some case studies examples that we've been working on. So just bear with me while we go through the theory. So at our lab, we focus on the creative application of visualization technologies, meaning that we take different types of data and visualize them using an aesthetically driven approach. So we often work in the field of public outreach, and we aim to imp improve science communication by incorporating technological methodologies with design sensibilities and perspectives taken from the visual arts and visual cultural studies. So my own research looks specifically at how aerial and digital technologies can be used creatively for the visualization of landscape heritage. In my practice, I use various types of aerial photography and combine them with methods borrowed both from 3D survey but also from visual effects filmmaking and animation. So I'm approaching this paper from the perspective of, of a filmmaker, um, although more recently, as you'll see a bit later on, we have been experimenting sort of in practice with some VR content. So what kind of got me into this area was just an interest in the ways in which these different media instill particular ways of seeing according to their cultural context and how that can be applied um, for our interest in, in visualizing built heritage. Um, so as such, I'd like to better understand not only the explicit methods so or the way in which we use um, or the, this kind of software and hardware that we would go about using film and VR, um, but also the implicit meanings behind these two media. Um, so with this in mind, I'd like to start by considering the origins of these two. Okay, so Andre Bazin proposed that the guiding myth behind the development of film was the notion of a total reality. That is to say that the on-screen world could one day be indistinguishable from the real world. Um, for Bazin, this myth would culminate in an image unburdened by the freedom of interpretation of the artist or the irreversibility of time. Of course, the notion, um, this notion was meant only as an originating ideology if there ever was an incarnation of Bazin's myth, then it lies in the idea of actuality film, um, which was pioneered first by the Lumiere brothers. They attempted to show naturalistic scenes unmediated by artistic influence um, or any kind of artificial narrative. It's the kind of building blocks of um, documentary film, I suppose. Um, so they're most renowned for their short film, The Arrival of the Train at the Station. Um, which reportedly appeared so true to life that it sent frightened audiences running from theatres. Of course, except of course it never did. In reality, audiences that, of the time were not the naive spectators, um, as has sometimes been imagined, but were able to distinguish between the real world and the artifice of the projected image. The attraction of cinema, then, lies, not, lies more in the aesthetic of the uncanny, so that is to say in a partial reality rather than any manifestation of Bazin's total reality. And this is evident in the explicitly artificial visual language of film today. So Lev Manovich later drew parallels between Bazin's guiding myth and the aspirations of VR technology. I think something that's, that's something we can recognise, certainly the yearning for a perfect facsimile of the real, um, has uh, sort of surrounded VR um, long in the decades before the head-mounted display technology um, has the kind of comfort, rendering capabilities and accessibility that we can see today. So while Bazin's total reality might be a useful guiding myth, we can fully expect, as we've seen in film, um, that the emerging visual language of VR is defined as much by the artifice of the virtual as it is by its integrity to the real. So there's another way of thinking about this. Instead of measuring film and VR by their proximity to the real, it might be more useful to consider the way in which they exploit the senses. The stereograph, popular in the late 19th century, used stereo vision to give a sense of presence in what Gurevich describes as a proto-cinematic spectacular attraction. Gurevich suggests that the way in which the stereograph and the motion picture 
call upon bodily engagement. So that's through stereo depth perception with a stereograph and through the persistence of vision um, with motion picture. Um, marked a radical departure, first of all, from the apparent indexicality, so that par apparent objectivity that was attributed to the photograph, but also it afforded both media with the attraction of spectacle. So for our purposes, it's not the intention here to draw a direct parallel between the stereograph and VR. Um, stereo vision is, of course, only a minor element of modern-day virtual reality as we know it but rather to highlight that a play upon the senses in itself lends an attraction to new media. So with all that in mind, what do we mean by this seemingly oxymoronic virtual reality? And this has been confused, as you're probably aware, in archaeology. The term VR has been used in the past to relate to all types of computer-generated imagery, which have tended towards a representation of the real. But today, we use the term specifically to refer to the embodied interaction enabled by the head-mounted display technologies and motion control devices. So just as we might pinch ourselves to check if we're dreaming, so as we look around in VR, the feedback loop that we receive um, via motion tracking technology convinces us in part that what we're seeing is real. So as such, we can say that VR, as we know it today, is by nature interactive. To remove that bodily interaction would be to remove the illusion upon which the virtual reality is based. So in practice, this interactivity comes in different levels. So we have, on the kind of one extreme, we have film where action takes place within a predetermined frame of view. We'll come back to that in a second. In cinematic VR, so the kind of the next level up, um, this allows the viewer to look around from a fixed position in 360 degrees. Um, albeit with limited interaction with the environment. This level includes both monocular and stereo 360 degree video when experienced through a headset, as well as some 3D environments where events take place according to a fixed narrative and the viewer is unable to fully navigate around the space. So on the next level up, if we take the interaction further in, in what we could call interactive VR, the user is able to engage more with the environment and to move around the space more freely, sometimes assisted by navigation tools, so teleportation being the obvious one. Um, and this is the level that we've become more interested in developing at the 3D Viz Lab. So part of the reasoning behind that is that the compromise of cinematic VR is that while the user is free to look around in any direction, their attention must be directed towards the important narrative elements without the use of the frame boundaries that are uh, available to film. Where this is done most successfully is where naturalistic elements in the scene are used to guide the viewer, as is also sometimes done in film. In their experiments, Nielsen et al. found that methods of guiding the viewer's attention that did not interfere with the freedom to look around the scene were most successful. It is this freedom of movement, again, that we consider to be the most powerful aspect of VR technology in the context of built heritage visualization. So with all that in mind, I want to talk about two examples of our work that have navigated some of the issues that are discussed here. So one is a short film piece that I produced for my PhD, and another is a VR environment that we've been developing at the 3D Viz Lab. Both projects aim to give a sense of presence based upon real-world heritage environments, but the way in which the feeling and atmosphere of the real-world place was translated into the virtual version was radically different in each case. So The Case of Thins is a short film um, that uses aerial footage to tell the story of a pair of Iron Age hillfort sites in the region of Angus in Scotland. The aim of the film is to integrate a sense of place inspired by the experience of the landscape with the archaeological interpretations of the site which are only visible from the air. To achieve this, the film prioritised photographic composition in the field. So the idea here was to allow the photographer or filmmaker to respond to their own experiences. And um, the idea, yeah, so the idea was that that would influence the resulting imagery um, of the final film. So in this case, the choice of framing was a key component to this, and it played a, a significant part in the resulting film. So I'm going to show, um, I think maybe not the full film, but I'll show the first kind of part of it, just to kind of give a sense of what I'm talking about here.
I'll stop it there. The um, the film is about four minutes in total, so it's not that long. So if we don't have time at the end, it's also online, so you can find it quite easily. Um, if we can just jump back in. Um, so just to summarise, so the film is, is uh, made up of footage taken from the ground as well as a, a combination of kite photography, drone footage and photography take from, taken from higher altitudes from a light aircraft. So actually the vast majority of the film is computer generated but it's based very closely upon photography that was shot in the field. So imagery was collect collected in all conditions at different times of year and different times of day and this is an important sort of, uh, sort of part of the design behind the film is to show the Caterthans as part of this living landscape, as part of a really dynamic um, place that was kind of changing all the time. Um, and the way in which the composition was made in response to that environment, again, was a key component. So the decision making that went into this framing was a key way in which the multi-sensory experience of the photographer was allowed to influence the visual results of the film. So that particular mechanism, of course, would be unavailable in VR. Um, so the second example I want to show is um, this VR environment that we've been developing at the 3D Viz Lab. So this is the HMS Hampshire. Um, it is a World War I shipwreck and war grave located off Bursley Head in Orkney. Um, in 2016, a photogrammetric survey of the wreck was carried out by divers, including Chris, who's here today, um, and that was done using cameras and high-powered lights. Um, you can see there's very little natural light on the uh, wreck, so this was all um, done using artificial lighting. Um, so the 3D Viz Lab, we've been experimenting with turning the resulting data, which is seen there on the right, um, into a VR experience. We wanted to present this data in the context of what it is like to dive on a historic shipwreck site and adopted some visual cues to help do this. Um, so if you just bear with me a second, I have another video. I, I know there's an irony in having, after everything I've just said about interactivity being key to VR, that I have to show <laughs> <laughs> the VR in video, but this is about as close as we'll get, unfortunately, um, without a lot more equipment in time. Um, so as the viewer moves around the space, foreground details are illuminated by virtual lights that are parented to the headset. Um, and the handheld motion controller. So the idea is that this would emulate some of the experience of the divers who are just illuminating um, just what they can see uh, with the artificial lights that they have with them. We also added fog and floating particles to do two things. It both emulated the appearance of the subsea environment, but also provided a point of reference in terms of the depth and the volume in the virtual space. So these naturalistic elements were designed to encourage the viewer to explore the scene but also to reinforce their interactions with this with the space. And um, so again, this is just trying to both moving lights, but also these kind of particles was designed to kind of reinforce that feedback with the way in which the, the, the viewer was moving around. And I'll just jump back in here. Um, yeah, so again, just to summarise, rather than viewing the photogrammetry data as an abstracted artefact, here we are using VR to allow the viewer to explore a historic wreck in the context of the experience of diving on the actual site. This is important because it affords the viewer a sense of discovery, but critically a sense of presence. So that is to say an impression that this virtual model relates to a real-world heritage environment out there that could be visited albeit in this case with great difficulty. Um, so to summarise, in these two examples, we found that different media call for entirely different considerations and approaches when developing content in the context of built heritage visualisation. The inherently interactive nature of VR sets it apart from film, where the viewer's attention is guided by the way in which the footage is framed. In film, framing can be used to tell the story not only of the on-screen elements, but also of the experiences of the photographer or filmmaker that are happening off-screen. In VR, other methods can be used to reintroduce the feeling and atmosphere of the real-world environment into the virtual space. These should reinforce the interactive nature of VR where possible. 
So the guiding myths that drive the development of new media, as we've seen, do not necessarily define the visual languages and practices that are later adopted. A modern incarnation of Bayesian's notion of the guiding myth might be seen in the Gartner hype cycle, where new technologies must pass through the peak of inflated expectations before eventually settling onto a plateau of productivity. As researchers and practitioners, I think that we have a responsibility to see past this cycle, particularly with VR technology, where there is so much invested commercial interest behind this hype, and to concentrate instead upon this slope of enlightenment. Here, the truly novel benefits of a new medium can be explored, and emerging tools can find a place within the existing toolkit for storytelling that is available to heritage professionals. The inherently interactive nature of VR means that there is no direct comparison to be made with film content. It is a truly new medium. While the possibilities that it presents have great promise in the field of built heritage visualization, rather than becoming the new norm, as has sometimes been suggested, which is going to somehow make film redundant, we can expect VR to instead stand alone as a radically different alternative to film. So that's me. I just want to say thank you very much.